Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this month's Cog Talk, uh, which this month is going to be on the topic of free will. Free will, this kind of idea that uh, we can actually control and have uh, a, a, an active input into our actions, is quite a subversive topic, particularly when we start to consider things such as the legal aspect and moral responsibility. It can also have a major impact on us uh, when we're actually uh, performing our day-to-day -day lives. And actually sometimes we might actually want to live behind some kind of illusion that we do or do not have some particular degree of free will, depending upon the action that we just performed. Now when I actually think of this kind of thing, I think about an incident that happened to me about 20 years ago. I can't believe it was that long ago, but um, yes, it was that long ago. And what happened was that I was out mountain biking up in the uh, Surrey Hills near the North Downs. And on that particular day, I decided to go out riding and go from the North Downs to the South Downs. And there were supposed to be these uh, trackways that were going to link up between the two uh, national routes. So I'd taken this, uh, this Ordnance Survey uh, map with me in order to try and figure out where do I turn after every particular turn that I've made. So, after about half an hour, I ended up in this field, going round and round in circles, thinking, where the blooming heck is this track that this is on this map? And uh, eventually I decided to get off the bike and uh, get the map out of the rucksack and try again for about the fifth time to see which direction should I be taking uh, to find this particular track. After looking at the map and realising that I'd actually just gone past this place about five times and I swore that I had not seen this particular track, what happens, I can only describe as a basil faulty moment, uh, to, 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 to my shame, that this poor innocent map got a certain degree of thrashing from the most feeble looking twig you can possibly imagine. And so I did this for about five, ten seconds or so, and I was interrupted by these horse hooves walking up to me. And uh, on top of this horse, this woman looks down at me and says, is everything all right? To which I just thought, like, does it look it? <laughs> um, but in terms of doing those particular actions, and I'm sure we've all had a Basil Fawlty moment at some point in our lives, we might wish to believe that actually, no, that really was not me. I had no control in that particular action. Other times, we might uh, wish that we do have some particular input into our uh, actions. So in this week's COG Talk, we have uh, two eminent speakers who are speaking to you today uh, on this topic of free will. First of all, we have Jan Schnapp from the University of Oxford, who's a professor of uh, neuroscience. And we also have Professor Helen Beebe, who is uh, the Samuel Hall uh, Professor of Philosophy at Manchester University. We're going to start off with Jan, who's going to start talking about how actually we don't have much control over what we actually do in our actions. Okay, can you uh, all hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm going to kick off my talk in a perhaps slightly unconventional way because I would like you to consider here a three-armed monkey. All right? Here we have a monkey who has um, two normal arms which are stuck in plastic tubes. All right? They're deliberately stuck in plastic tubes so that that monkey can't use his normal arms to reach for the pieces of marshmallow that look at this monkey. You know, very tentatively. Instead, the monkey has to use this robot arm, all right, that, um, in order to reach for that marshmallow. That robot arm, sort of is hidden behind this sort of piece of apparatus here, is actually this, uh, a little brain implant. Right? Actually, this was shot deliberately from that angle because, uh, angle because the people who made this video in the United States didn't want you to get freaked out by that implant. Uh, I think that's a bit squeamish, so I got you here a picture of another primate, okay, who has an identical implant. Right, this is an identical implant implanted into a person called uh, Matthew Nagel. The good thing about this person, Matthew Nagel, is that we can ask him, does it hurt? And he assures us that it doesn't, all right, if you implant it carefully with under anesthesia and uh, so on. So we're pretty confident that this monkey, who seems to be very happy munching his marshmallows, also is not suffering uh, from this particular experiment. Why is this relevant? Okay, it is relevant because you can this robot arm is controlled by the monkey deciding that I want to move that robot arm. Okay. So you can only make this happen if you really understand to quite a lot, quite a high degree, what happens in our brains when we decide that we want to do something. Uh, it's a fascinating topic uh, that I can only give you the barest outline from. But of course, you know, there's a lot that we know about our brains and how they, you know, how they go about choosing actions. 
Uh, ultimately, all the actions that we choose to do have to converge on a part of our brain that is shown here in red, the primary motor cortex, the motor strip. Uh, we've known for a long, long time uh, that there's a little homunculus, all right, on that straight, a little, a little person, right, in the sense that, you know, this part of it will move my legs, this part of it will move my face, uh, this part here will move my arm, all right? So if you want to decide, you know, if you want to work out whether a monkey wants to move an arm or not, whether it's the second or the third arm, you, this is the part of the brain where you want to record activity. What would the activity look like when you record from it? You know, the, these sort of um, uh, devices actually designed based on findings uh, by um, uh, an American, Greek, originally Greek, but now American neuroscientist with a wonderful name of Apastopoulos Georgopoulos, okay, who basically uh, discovered already in the 1980s that neurons in this motor strip, in the uh, primary motor cortex, are tuned for directions of motion. So they basically, if you record from a neuron in the hand area of that monkey, um, uh, th you'll basically find that just before the monkey decides to move his hand in a particular direction, uh, these neurons uh, might fire. If the monkey decides to move the hand in an opposite direction, the neurons will fire less. So the way to read this here is that each of these little dots all right, is, is when one nerve impulse happened in one neuron in the brain of that monkey. Of course, that monkey has millions of these, right? but there'll be a few thousand that are about moving your hands. And some of them will want to move the hand in this direction. Others will want to move the hand in that direction. Others will want to, you know. Uh, this particular neuron, from which all of these recordings are, likes moving your hand to the left. Uh, so if, you, if the hand is actually moved to the left, they fire more. If the hand is actually moved to the right, they fire less. Interestingly, they fire all the time, even if the hand doesn't move at all. All right, they just start to fire more just about the, just about at the time when the monkey decides, I'm now going to move my hand to the left. All right, the decision moment is happening here. The, um, um, and you basically, you know, if you've got a few hundred of these neurons all agreeing, now is the time to move the hand to the left, the hand will move to the left. All right, it's up to the, to, the, to the neurons to do this. But, you know, I wanted to just point out to you, there is this spontaneous activity, which basically means that this part of the brain, your motor cortex, is actually constantly entertaining the idea that I might want to move my hand to the left. While other parts of other neurons are going to entertain the idea I might want to move my hand to the right. Most of the time, you don't fidget about all the time, right? So this sort of, these sort of suggestions, think of each of these nerve impulses as a suggestion. Maybe you might want to move your hand. Maybe you might want to move your hand. Maybe you want to move. They kind of, you know, somebody's going to decide whether this is a good idea or not. All right. Who is that somebody? Well, it's other neurons. Okay. Uh, you know, the... Um, so the first idea that I want you to take away is that I sort of decisions of what do I want to do are encoded, you know, are basically represented by populations of neurons that have a particular preference for a particular action. And when these populations of neurons manage to become very active, then you will do this sort of thing. All right? If you record these, you know, the neurons that are in the primary motor area will have very simple actions involved with them. But then you also get this sort of supplementary motor area and the prefrontal uh, premotor area here. If you, these uh, actually have more abstract motion ideas involved. Okay? They contain, for example, so-called mirror neurons. Okay? They will fire either if a monkey engages in a complex action, such as biting a pea, something, sucking something, you know, pouting. Um, but these neurons will also fire when they actually observe somebody else carrying out these um, particular actions. So they represent these actions in a more abstract way. Okay. But they still, you know, so it's not just about moving my hand left or right, it's about I might want to go and make myself a cup of tea. All right? There's also populations of neurons that do this, and they too are spontaneously active in my brain all the time. So I actually, to an extent, you know, there's parts of my brain that want to go and make a cup of tea all the time. Right. Um, and they live in the cortex here, all right? They live in the, pre they live in the primary motor cortex or the um, secondary motor cortical areas. So how do we decide whether, the, you know, whether the, now is actually the time to make a cup of tea? You know, or move my hand to the left or scratch my head or, you know, hopefully not do anything too embarrassing in front of you all. Uh, well, the cortex um, will basically submit these ideas, right, to uh, a, a series of, think of them as, um, you know, um, committees, all right, which are more neurons that live in the basal ganglia. Right? So you've got um, information being sent from the cortex 
to the basal ganglia, and there they can get, sort of go round and round in a loop. Right? And this loop can either reinforce the idea, or it can poo-poo and kill the idea. Right? So somehow, now the responsibility for choosing what is the right action has moved here from these cortex neurons to these neurons in the basal ganglia. How on earth does the basal ganglia know whether it's a good idea for me to go make a cup of tea? Right? Um, well, the basal ganglia, they actually have the benefit of having dopaminergic inputs uh, from uh, other brain areas in the brainstem. Uh, they basically drive how much activity we're going to have in the first place. They also drive experience. They give us, a, you know, these neurons, interesting, and I'll say more about that in just a moment, they are active, for example, when we have a feeling of success. All right. If we have a feeling of success, we are more active. It's like a signal, go and reap. All right. More of these things should be reinforced, please. All right. um, they also thereby uh, uh, actually ingrain in our brain actions that have proven to be successful in the past. All right. Very, very important concept here. You know, your brain, is, this loop is all about accumulating experiences of what type of actions work in some sense, all right? And that makes it likely that these actions uh, become more spontaneous, you know, but become more likely in the past. Here are two very unfortunate people who've got problems with their basal ganglia. They have opposite problems, all right? This person has not enough dopamine going into the basal ganglia. This person has too much dopamine going into the basal ganglia. Um, and this person can barely get out of the chair, all right? Although there's nothing wrong with her legs. She just cannot, you know, she wants to get up, but she cannot formulate that decision to just move up and walk off, all right? This person has all these constant ideas of, you know, maybe I want to move my hand, maybe I want to move my elbow, being expressed constantly, all right? Um, because, you know, you no longer have that censorship that's given by the basic ganglia, all right? These people are both perfectly free to want to get up or to stop fidgeting, but they're not. So the idea that these people have a free will isn't particularly helpful to them. Um, what more have I got for you? All right. So really, what I want you to, to you know, the, this sort of decision-making process. What I'm going to do next happens in loops around your brain. You've got your primary motor cortex talking, talking to um, uh, your striatum, uh, you know, about motion, you know, about things that I want to do immediately. All right. Do I scratch my nose? Uh, similarly, limbic structures, um, you know, other parts of the brain are about, you know, what do I desire? What do I desire now? What do I desire in the future? Uh, and all of these, you know, parts of the brain, they all have these sort of loops, uh, modifiable loops, loops that learn from experience. And this learning from experience is driven also by um, input from these um, dopaminergic neurons that sit in the, um, you know, sit in the brainstem. Um, and if you, you know, if you basically inappropriately micro-stimulate these, you can make an animal, or a person, for that matter, think that things are desirable, which really aren't. Okay, you basically give them a, a wrong feeling of, this is worth trying. Okay, you, there's, sort of, there's some experiments where people have electrically stimulated these things um, in order to get um, rats to push a button. Every time they push a button, they get a little stimulus here. They think, oh, this must be a really good thing to do. And they do this until they're completely exhausted. Uh, this is actually the same path where they get stimulated by addictive drugs. Right? So is, an, is a person who's addicted free to choose not to be addicted? I'm not sure that that is really a, you know, a very sensible way of thinking about it. Addiction happens when a, a pathway that is really meant to reinforce behaviors that have been successful, that allowed you to achieve food when you needed it, that allowed you to achieve maybe sexual gratification when it was an appropriate time to do so. Um, uh, basically send out to your basal ganglia and to your prefrontal cortex, this was a good thing to do. Right. Um, and, um, you know, so we know about pathways in the brain that ingrain experience. We also know about pathways in the brain that learn to fear things. Right? They live, for example, in your amygdala. Okay? Uh, you can take the amygdala out of people, well, you shouldn't. You know, you're, you're not allowed to. All right? It's assault. But if you took the amygdala out of people, they wouldn't be afraid of anything anymore. They'd be happier. Would they be more successful in a Darwinian sense? That's a very different question. Right? We know about parts of the brain uh, that control appetites, such as your motor frontal cortex. All of these feed information into this decision-making process that just you know, crunches constantly all the different possibilities of what I might want to do next. Right? They all shape the activity that keeps rushing around in our brains. Okay? 
Uh, that's the way I want you to, to think about you know, your life. Okay? I've completely redesigned your conception of your, yourself, I think, just now. I hope you didn't find it too painful. Um, so to just sum up, all right, my brain made me do it is always true. All right? It's trivially true. Um, there's nobody else taking any control. Okay? Uh, we have no choice but to do, carry out actions that are selected by our brains, and our brain selects them just by, by you know, constantly trying to provide guesses of what might be an appropriate action given our experience and given our appetites and given our fears. This sort of action selection is really designed to cope with a lot of uncertainty. Okay? I don't know whether a particular action is going to be successful in the future right? or, how, you know, or whether it's going to be a bad one. Right? Uh, there are also a lot of conflicting demands. Sometimes I might want to you know, kiss a lady who might not want to be kissed. Right? So conflicting demands. Um, um, often decision making has to be quick. Much of it happens without me being even aware of it. Interestingly, there are parts of the brain that you can stimulate which will make people twitch, but they think they wanted to move. They don't realize that this was actually desired to move that you've implanted in them. Um, so finally, I'd like to say you know, it's, it's better to choose wisely than to choose freely. Right? And therefore, you know, evolution won't equip you with a free will module. It will just try and equip you with modules that do a reasonably good job at guessing what might be a sensible action. Right? Uh, so I'm not sure that the idea of sort of a freedom is particularly <coughs> useful at all. Um, finally, I've had far too little time to tell you about all these things. If you want to find more about it, you've got a website called howyourbrainworks.net where you can find lengthy lectures that explain all these different pathways and um, things in, uh, in detail. All right. Thank you for your attention. And I'll Thanks, Jan. Come back, That's better. Uh, thanks, Jan, for that uh, instimulating talk. So I think we can take from that that in Jan's previous experience, he has not made a cup of tea whilst he was actually giving a lecture. So he's, he's had that kind of feedback. Uh, we're now going to hand over to Helen, who's going to take uh, a slightly different take on this, uh, on this topic and suggest actually that we do have uh, much more control about our particular actions. focus on that idea that my brain made me do it. And in effect, what I really want to do is to say, I agree with him that probably my brain did make me do it most of the time, or maybe all of the time, um, but we shouldn't be worried by that. We shouldn't think that that compromises our free will or our moral responsibility. Um, I'm actually not going to say really anything about free will. Um, I want to think more in terms of moral responsibility, and I'm kind of thinking of free will as whatever it is um, by virtue of which you get to be morally responsible. I accept that that's not very helpful, but I think it helps to think in terms of moral responsibility. Um, so, and here's a, 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 a standard argument that, that Jan didn't actually quite give you, but which is a very popular line of argument to take. The thought is, well, look, if my brain made me do it, then, you know, I'm not really responsible for what I did. It was my brain, it's my brain, but of course you can't blame my brain. It's not a kind of morally responsible agent. So I'm not morally responsible for what I do. And I want to claim that the first bit of that is right. My brain did make me do it, um, but it doesn't follow that you're not morally responsible for what you do. So one thing I think is really important that we distinct is, is that we distinguish between two things that you might be worrying about here. One is the making part, right? So my brain made me do it. My brain somehow predetermined that I would do what I did. And the other part is the brain bit, right? There's something distinctively worrying about the thought that it was your brain that made you do it. So I want to talk about those two things separately. So let's start by talking about the making part. So the idea here is, look, the worry is that if my brain made me do it, then surely I was predetermined to do it. Uh, there's a very old debate um, in the philosophy of free will to do with the compatibility between free will and determinism. Um, I'm a card-carrying compatibilist. I think that free will and determinism are entirely compatible with each other. Uh, I'm not going to argue for that. I'm just going to kind of gesture towards um, the thought that that's not too worrying, the idea that I was predetermined to do it. What might predetermine me to do it? It might be all kinds of things. States of my brain, my external environment, 
my genes, my upbringing, my psychological dispositions, whatever it is. So I'm not really focusing on the brain so much here as the idea of being predetermined. So now, the question I want to ask is, is being, the fact that you've been predetermined to do something really a problem? Well, I'm going to um, conduct a little experiment here. I'm going to um, invite members of the audience. If anybody would like to come up to the front of the room um, and tell a really rude joke, go ahead. Uh, you've got, oh, and there's 50p in it, 50p <laughs> if you do it. So I'm going to give you five seconds. Go on, five, four, someone's thinking about it, three, <laughs> two, one. Oh, nobody took me up on my offer. Um, <laughs> I predict. I, I made a prediction earlier. This is like this is. I'm like. I'm just like Darren Brown here. <laughs> Guess what my prediction was? My prediction was that nobody would do it, and indeed, nobody did it. Uh, here's another prediction. I can't run this experiment because it would be unethical. But imagine this is a large experiment. Imagine that you're walking along the road and you see a small child kind of in a lot of trouble in a sort of in a pool of water or something like that. Now, there's no cost to you for just picking the child up out of the pool of water. Maybe your shoes will get a little bit wet, but you're not going to be late. You're not, nothing bad's going to happen, but you will have saved a child. What would you do in that situation? I would like you to predict that every single person in this room would go and save the child. So, it seems to me that most of us, most of the time, or at least a lot of the time, are pretty predictable, and this is something that we know about each other, right? Um, if we didn't know this about each other, we wouldn't be able to interact with each other in the way that we do. We depend upon the fact that people are predictable. Um, looks, so it looks to me that uh, we're very often, at least, predetermined to do what we do. Uh, and a lot of us are predetermined just, just, just the same sorts of ways. People do go and pick the child up or decline the kind offer to come and tell a rude joke 50p. Um, you might think that's a problem. I personally don't think that's a problem. Um, but. In a sense, the point I want to make is that even if you do think that's a problem, those neuroscientific discoveries that, sh that show us that there are past states of our brain, as it turns out, but there are facts about us kind of prior to our conscious decision making that predetermine what we're going to do, don't really change the situation, right? We already knew that in lots of situations we were predetermined to do what we were going to do. We already knew that we were predictable people by and large. Um, and indeed, right, given that we know that we're pretty predictable, here's another fact about us all. We all go around holding each other responsible all the time. Um, so it seems as though that's at least prima facie evidence to suggest that kind of in the minds of normal people like you and me, actually we don't think, or we certainly don't act as though there's much of a conflict between the idea that we're predetermined to do what we do and the idea that we're morally responsible. Okay, so now I want to focus on the specific um, worry that you get from neuroscience that it's the brain that made me do it. So you might think, well, okay, maybe it's okay if my sort of psychological dispositions or whatever made me do it, but maybe there's something particularly troubling about the idea that it was my brain that did it. Um, so you might think, here's, um, so here's the sort of suggestion that one gets when one thinks about the monkey case, or if you do this with people, um, where there's um, activity that's going on in your brain prior to you consciously making a decision about what to do, um, the worry is, well, look, there's all this stuff going on prior to my, deci my conscious decision, um, and you can infer from that prior stuff what I'm going to do, so surely that makes my conscious decision, my conscious mental state, um, kind of causally irrelevant to what I do. Surely that means that my conscious mind just didn't have anything to do with it. Now, that would be a problem. I think that really would be a problem if your conscious mind was just kind of causally completely redundant, didn't have anything to do with anything you did. I think that would be a deeply <laughs> worrying situation to be in. But here's what we need to ask now. What's the relationship supposed to be between the brain and the mind? So when you say, my brain made me do it, it's as though you're denying that this other thing, your mind, made you do it. And I want to question that. So here, I think, is a fairly common sense. This is my incredibly sophisticated PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> a fairly common sense. Uh, view about the causes of action. Uh, we all know that stuff that goes on in our brain um, plays a causal role in what we do, right? Um, it would be quite odd to think that the states of your brain had nothing to do with your behavior. We also sort of pre-theoretically in common sense think that our mental, our mind causes us to do things, right? Um, you have a certain desire to make a cup of tea, you go and make a cup of tea. Uh, not always in Jan's case, because he constantly wants a cup of tea. Um, now, here's what you might, right, so it seems to me that the idea that there's something worrying about the idea that my brain made me do it, that that somehow takes away the thought that uh, my mind had anything to do with it, uh, 
It's as though somehow the fact that your, bre your brain is causing your actions precludes the possibility that your mind's doing it, right? We have to kind of just remove that arrow. But now, as I said, the question we need to ask is what is the relationship between these two things supposed to be, the brain and the mind? Um, my answer is they are the same thing. Your mind just is your brain. It's not this extra thing uh, that's somehow floating out there, sort of an immaterial substance or a soul or something. It just is the brain. And if you think that the mind it just is the brain, it's just not clear why you should worry about the thought that the, your brain made you do it, because it was just your mind that made you do it, and that doesn't seem nearly so worrying, the idea that you mind, your mind made you do it. So here's the kind of picture that I think is sometimes suggested by some of the neuroscientific experiments, um, particularly the monkey one at the beginning that Jan was talking about. Uh, what you often, all right, so the things on the left are supposed to represent brain states. I'm not entirely sure what their pictures are, but some sort of brain things. Um, think of these <laughs> different brain states. Um, you get a causal sequence, earlier states are causing later states, and eventually they lead to action. And now over on the right, we have conscious mental states. Not every conscious mental state is going to be, so the, the idea is that your conscious, what I want to claim is that your conscious mental states are just a, a certain kind of brain state, right? So when you're in a certain kind of brain state, a lot of the time that just is some conscious mental state. Um, what you get a lot with the, uh, uh, with the neuros in neuroscientific experiments is you get kind of correlations between earlier phases here, the things sort of down the bottom um, that, that aren't identical with conscious mental states at all, um, and you get a nice correlation between those brain states and the action, and the thought is that kind of precludes the possibility that your conscious mental states are doing any of the work. But now, um, again, we have the question, well, what's the relationship supposed to be between that conscious mental state and your brain states? And again, I want to say the answer to that question is they are the very same thing, right? Um, when you have a conscious mental state, you decide to move your arm to the left or whatever it is, that just is some brain state. And you shouldn't be that surprised if it turns out that that brain state itself was caused by prior brain states. I mean, what else would you expect, right? That it somehow just kind of comes out of nowhere. Um, so if you think that the conscious mental state just is a brain state, then again, um, it's entirely plausible to think that both the conscious mental state and the brain state are causing you to act, right? Because they're just the very same thing. So there's nothing puzzling about that. So although you get nice correlations and indeed a causal relation going from these unconscious brain states to your action, that just doesn't preclude the possibility that the later brain states, which are themselves just conscious mental states, also cause the action. Right? So we don't get that idea that because your brain is causing you to do stuff, that means that your conscious mind isn't doing anything. So I think there's neither a problem with the idea that your brain made you do it, um, nor a problem with the idea that your brain made you do it. So just to sum up, I want to say, yes, look, my brain did make me do it. Um, my mind also made me do it, my conscious mind. Um, that just doesn't compromise our moral responsibility for what we do. Um, I think it's just, in a way, part of just our ordinary conception of um, the relationship between the mind and the brain. When you say, as I frequently did when I was a child, um, my brother made me do it because, for example, he was offering, you know, he was making some terrible threat to rip the head off my Barbie doll and flush it down the toilet or whatever it was. Um, when, I, when I truly said that my brother made me do it, which I didn't always, um, that really did get me off the hook, right? That really did mean that um, it was kind of his fault and not my fault. But when you say my brain made me do it, even if what you're saying is true, that doesn't get you off the hook. You're still culpable for what you do. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Helen, for that uh, take on there. Actually, a lot more of our conscious actions are indeed under our own control. Uh, we now come to the fun part of the evening, when it's all over to you. Uh, time to ask questions. So uh, we'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can. So do we have any questions on this topic? Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to sort of investigate the idea of um, the brain being the person. I don't disagree at all, actually, with the idea that the mind and the brain are synonymous. But sometimes the brain is dysfunction. So we saw in Jan's presentation, there was a people with a brachycardia or... Yeah, and um, so they weren't actually responsible for their actions in some, at some level. They weren't responsible for action. Their, their, their sort of neural dysfunction wasn't partic didn't have any real moral connotations. But, uh, so somewhere between that and something which is actually probably illegal is something like, say, Tourette's syndrome, where people are actually, they would probably have, they would have won the 50p, maybe. Um, so um, are they responsible? 
Uh, Jan, do you want to focus that question first upon moral responsibility? Uh, sure, this is a, is a, a big topic and I think it's an important one. Um, there are... I've been to an absolutely fascinating lecture at the recent Society for Neuroscience conference that was uh, entitled The Neuroscience of Sex and Violence. And um, the talk certainly did its uh, subject justice. Um, the, it was a presentation by an American neuroscientist who discovered neurons in the um, hypothalamus um, where you've got very small populations of neurons that either turn you on sexually or make you very cross. Right? These are overlapping populations. And he was able to electrically, you know, to stimulate them uh, either with light or electrically. And if he stimulated them just a little bit, right, the mice that he was working with would, would get, you know, they'd all cozy up to each other and then stim stimulate the same neurons a little harder. And then that male mouse that was courting that female just a second ago suddenly started laying into her terribly aggressively and the female muscles all freaked out about what was going on. So um, I came out of this thinking, you know, my God, you know, if you, it doesn't take much, right, for much dysregulation of these tiny amounts of brain, uh, you know, of, of, of neural tissue to get people sort of heavily into sadomasochism and all these sort of things. And is it their fault? I think it probably isn't their fault. But similarly, it's not the hungry lion's fault that he wants to eat my child, but I'm still going to lock up the hungry lion. You know, so I think we we do need to rethink responsibility to, to responsibility to a very large, very large extent. You know, I think at the end of the day, all our brains are trying to guess what type of actions are going to be optimal. But this optimality is sort of comparing apples with oranges. You know, on the one hand, we want to conform, right, and we don't want to be we want to live well with our fellow human beings. On the other hand, we may have desires or whatever that are, you know, you know that, 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 that are also real. Right? So I think this is a real problem. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we also, we also have an, an instinct uh, that makes us want to cooperate in a, in a society. And we understand that as part of that instinct, uh, there needs to be uh, low violence, there needs to be a degree of fairness in the way resources are shared and things like that. Thanks very much, yeah. Uh, Helen, do you have a comment on uh, that? Yeah, it's just, ooh, it's um, yeah, I think that's a really nice question. Um, I guess my view would be, uh, yeah, look, sometimes we're not morally responsible for what we do, right? The claim is that we're always morally responsible for what we do. Um, and if you, uh, but the question is to be answered um, by thinking about how much control you have over your psychological state. So now, there are certain kinds of... Um, things that can be done to your brain or brain disorders which do compromise your ability to have psychological control over um, your actions. Um, so in those sorts of cases, um, you're not morally responsible and your lack of moral responsibility really does stem from some feature of your brain, but it's only because that's compromising your ability to have psychological control, right? So uh, if someone is, is making you very aggressive because they're like sticking, uh, you know, shining a light inside your brain, say, um, I would say that they're morally <laughs> responsible for what you do and not you, right? But it's not because there's something going on in your brain, it's because you've lost the kind of control over your psychology that, that we normally expect people to have. Because, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the issue, of course, is, you know, if you, if you shine a light into these neurons in order to stimulate them um, sort of artificially, some people, are, you know, some animals may just be born with, you know, uh, iron channels in those neurons that are oversensitive, right? So they don't need somebody to shine a light on it. It was in this case just, you know, their genetic, a, a, a genetic accident that made them fly off the handle and become ultra-violent at, you know, the smallest provocation. So it's maybe, you know, to just say, oh look, you know, it's a... And then it's nobody's fault. And I just, I just, and we don't know how large a proportion of violent criminals is that are actually in a state like that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I, I don't at all want to claim that uh, the answers to these questions are, are easy. I think they're not easy at all. Um, and I also think it's true that there's a certain amount of moral luck that goes on. I mean, you, uh, we all know that our genes and our upbringing, well, certainly we know that our upbringing massively affects the kinds of people we become, um, our ability to regulate our behavior and so on and so on. The same is going to be true of our genetic inheritance. Um, so in a lot of cases it is, you know, it, it, you're lucky if you... Uh, 
have the right genetic background and the right social background to not be inclined to fly off the handle or whatever it is, or not be aggressive or whatever it is. Um, but I don't think that makes the question of whether an individual person is behaving aggressively or whatever it is, um, you know, is entirely out of their control. I mean, in some cases, maybe it is out of their control, and it's very difficult to tell a story that divides between them, but the thought is that story, we have to tell that story in psychological terms, right? Is this person, I mean, I mean are they seriously able to modify their behavior if they're given the right kind of, um, or maybe the right kind of drugs or the right kind of psychological training or whatever? I think those, I mean, that wasn't an answer, that was a gesture towards the, the kind of place one should look for an answer. Thanks very much, Helen. Uh, been, thanks for the question. We've got them warmed up now, so they're starting to talk. So if we go just over there. <coughs> yep. Um, no, that's right. Um, without wishing to upset anybody, I, I disagree profoundly with both speakers' uh, basic <laughs> premises. Because science today, establishment science, is entirely reductionist and materialist-based, mechanistic. And they have, the, they have the front ground. And if you try and get, a, for example, someone like Robert Lanza, or Rupert Sheldrake, or Dean Radin, or any of these people who are well-established scientists, try and get their papers into with well-established so-called reputable journals, they find quite often they can't do so, because the journals are afraid they'll become the laughing stop of this type of science, which is reductionist, and therefore they're laughed at and out of court. It seems to me that classical science was completely, basically put on the back pedal when um, quantum physics came along, which proves that everything is not as you see it on the surface. It's basically back to Berkeley and idealism, which is that, you know, everything could be an idea in God's mind, or everything is not as you see it. I mean, it's now known, absolutely, even, except, even, even most uh, reductionist scientists accept the fact that they observe that quantum level is affected by the observer, which is astonishing. And the other thing is, there's no such thing that no one knows where the seat of consciousness is. Reductionist scientists are always trying to say, oh, we'll find a place somewhere in the brain, but they haven't found it, and it's probably very unlikely that they will. I mean, it, they, they want everything to be an epiphenomena of the brain. It's all reductionist materialist based. There is only matter and energy in the universe and that's it. But it seems to me this whole thing is going to be thoroughly exploded shortly and a lot of people are going to have to rethink things very thoroughly because at the moment reductionist science, everyone's nicely settled and there the establishment science, the careers depend on its salaries, positions, papers, all that sort of thing. And I don't think, and all the great discoveries in science have quite often been made not by accumulative research but by, um, by literally quantum leaps. I mean, for example, Copernicus and Galileo, the, the establishment of their day, which is no way different from ours in many ways, in that it was controlled by an establishment which happened to be the medieval church, uh, they said, oh no, we don't go, you know, the world doesn't go around the earth, in fact, it's rather the other way around, we go around the sun. Oh, absolute heinous, um, you know, behavior that. So they were locked up, or put away, or, or like Giordano Bruno burnt at the stake. And I think that sort of thing's happening now, except they've become rather more civilized and don't actually burn people or shoot them for their views. <laughs> Okay, Jan, did you want to... <laughs> is it all about to explode? <laughs> well, I just, um, it's difficult to come back to this because you raised so many points at once that I'm just not sure which, uh, which particular... I mean, you know, I've got, I've got an awful lot to say about what you just said. I, uh, you know, it's very nice that we can sort of heartily disagree on so many points. Um, but in the interest of, you know, not completely, uh, you, know, you know, sort of, you know, just monopolizing this for the next hour, I'm just wondering what particular point you'd like me to to answer, you know, the, the, the quant that quantum theory is going to solve it all, or that, or, or do you want me to talk about reductionism? You know, I mean, I'm very much a reductionist, but I mean, being... Okay, so I mean, you know, let me just say a little bit about reductionism. I'm, I'm fervently a reductionist neuroscientist. I believe that everything that happens in my brain is basically a dance of, you know, salt dissolved in water molecules, bashing about, you know, under thermal motion, uh, you know, through, through uh, you know, and sort of fat droplets called neurons. But, you know, and that's the, you know, I've reduced it to a billion, you know, a hundred billion neurons filled each with, you know, tens of millions of, you know, ions that float about in a, in a dance of such complexity that it is inconceivable, all right? So that's what I've reduced it to. So, I mean, I think one belittles reductionist science. You can be a reductionist science, a scientist and nevertheless be completely blown away by the majesty and complexity and wonderfulness and intricacy of what is going on in front of your very eyes. And you don't need to invoke, you know, quantum mysteries in order to try and be, you know, completely, um, you know, uh, blown away by this and also by the possibilities that this arise, that it produces. Quantum, there's a lot of stuff that's very misunderstood. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is certainly one of them. The idea that, you know, you, you necessarily change what you observe, mm, that's not really what he meant. Um, 
Yeah, I'm aware of those, you know, they, but they don't really help us because the only other thing that they do is, you know, I mean, uh, people have kind of looked towards quantum theory as being something that gets you beyond um, sort of uh, billiard ball determinism, right, which you had maybe before quantum theory where, you know, one, you know, if you just knew, uh, you know, sort of this is the Laplace demon idea, if you knew that every particle in the universe, the way it moved and how they bump into each other, you'd be able to predict into the future. Quantum theory tells us that there may well be things that are absolutely random, right? that they have no particular cause at all. Well, that doesn't really buy me free will, it just buys me noise in my brain. I think noise in my brain is useful, all right? and I, I personally believe that there's a lot of stuff that happens just randomly, but it's not going to tie us all together in a big love, fe love fest of cosmic superposition of uh, wave functions. It's just... Um, that's, uh, no, but I mean, it's, I mean, but other people have, you know. So I mean, I just think one has to also be a little bit careful to just say, oh, look, you know, I don't, I don't understand every intricacy yet, so therefore it has to be quantum. Would you accept that there are some reputable physicists in the world who have well, well received publications that do not agree with you? What were the other? I'd, I'd, I'd certainly, you know, I'm aware of the fact that not everybody agrees with me. Yes, and that's just fine. <laughs> Ellen, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, um, I actually agree with everything Jan just said, um, but I would want to add a couple of things. One is, um, I don't think quantum mechanics in any way supports the kind of Barclian idealist view about anything. I mean, the Barclian view is that there, that there are just lines and that's it, right? You don't get that from quantum mechanics. Um, the other thing to say is, although I am also a card-carrying reductionist in at least some sense, um, I did want to, to query the part where you said oh, if you're a reductionist, you're kind of committed to the view that consciousness is somehow epiphenomenal. It, epiphenomenal. I mean, part of the point of what I was saying was precisely that you don't need to think that consciousness is epiphenomenal. That's entirely consistent with thinking that the mind and the brain are essentially just the same thing. Um, what is the mind, then? Where does consciousness come from? It's very secret. I can't explain it. From the main problem today, and, and reductionist scientists, we see this as like quantum physics. In the quantum physics, scientists who can't bear the thought Science and religion, whatever you want to call spirituality, whatever you want to call it, and this is uh, coming closer and closer together, they can't bear that. So, what they do is they say quantum physics works, that's fine, let's make it work. But as for the meaning of it, the, uh, the, the ultimate meaning of what it's there for, well, you can leave that to another day. Probably a question for uh, afterwards, I'd say. Uh, next question. Hello. Um, thinking about, um, if we think about free will, um, then it's fair to say, as, as um, Helen pointed out, that most of the things we do most of the time are very, very predictable, particularly look, if we look at large groups of people, then we, we, we can't predict what's going to happen an awful lot of the time. Um, so maybe the free will lies in this gap between um, where we, we can't predict things, this sort of res residue of behaviour that is, is unknown. And if we look at, if we taking a sort of reductionist view of this, then we say, okay, if we look at the monkey um, doing this particular, making this particular, um, producing this particular action, or if we look at people who have um, these motor disorders, and therefore you get, you, you get um, twitches and, and sort of these sort of fairly low level motor movements, then there the relationship between neural activity and action is quite clear. But if we think about, say, okay, I'm going to have a dinner party on Saturday, who should I invite? what shall I cook, um, then the, 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 the chance of anyone predicting that is, is relatively remote. Okay, if you know someone very, very well, then maybe you'll get there in the end. Okay, but so the, this unpredictability presumably comes in the fact that we have our brains, which are clearly making us do it, are incredibly complex and interconnected. So you can predict at a simple neural level the, how these these neurons firing are going to produce some sort of action, but the interconnection of these neurons, these billions of neurons, and, and billions and billions of interconnections, is actually highly um, unpredictable due to complexity. Is that fair to say? Helen, would you like to make a comment on predictability? Um, I don't want to make any scientific claims. Um, <laughs> you're definitely outside my area of expertise. Um, I think you're right, though, human I mean, it would be incredibly boring um, if we were all predictable all the time, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, um, that uh, human societies could function if we were predictable all the time. Um, but the thing I want to resist is the idea that um, 
there's a kind of connection between free will and unpredictability, right? So I want to say, okay, in some cases we can't predict, right? I can't predict what you're going to cook for your, your dinner party next week, and maybe nobody can. Um, but does your decision to cook one thing rather than another depend upon the thought that, you know, it's ultimately unpredictable which of those, which, which of the opportune options you'll go for? Um, I want to say no, no more than the fact that um, your being morally praiseworthy for having saved the drowning child in the pool of water depends upon there being some slight chance that you actually just walk on by, right? I want to say that, um, sure, some of our actions are unpredictable, and maybe some of those actions are unpredictable because they're genuinely undetermined, maybe, but I just want to, uh, I want to claim that that's just irrelevant for the, for the question of moral responsibility, right? Even if there's literally no possibility that you could walk past the child without saving them, I still want to say you're praiseworthy for doing it. Thanks, Helen. Yeah? Maybe just to um, elaborate a little bit on this, on this um, notion of the, you know, unpredictability in, of neural responses, I think it's really quite an important one. Um, you know, because Helen kind of alluded to this and said maybe, you know, maybe your actions are unpredictable because your neural firing patterns are going to be to some extent unpredictable. The details of neural firing patterns are unbelievably unpredictable. You know, and often surprisingly so. I mean, you know, sort of, um, I've done sort of recordings from neurons in very low-level sensory areas. You know, you might be recorded from, you know, parts of your brain that respond to sound, and I want to work out how they respond to sound, how they, you know, uh, find out different sound qualities. I record from these neurons, I record, you know, nerve impulses that they produce when I play a particular sound. Okay, if I present 20 times the identical sound, I get 20 different responses from that neuron in an animal that is anesthetized and sitting there doing absolutely nothing. Right? And I get 20 times a different response to the same sound that I play. You know, this is just a most simple thing. Right? So there's, a, there's an enormous amount of stuff that goes on in our brain that is, for all intents and purposes, completely random. Right? There will be things where you know, the influences on us are very strong. You know, instincts to conform, instincts to save a child, uh, you know, uh, that, that will override these things, but there will often be cases where when we try to make decisions, um, you know, the, the slightest thing can flip it one way or the other because our decision making has to happen, you know, often in such an uncertain world. You know, I mean, it's also, kind of, it's also worth to reflect a little bit about what it is that our brains are actually trying to do when we're trying to decide how to act. You know, and you often have to you often have to try and solve solve unsolvable problems because you have to compare apples with oranges. What is more important? You know, if you're given the chance of being you know five minutes late for a meeting or saving a child, it's obvious. But um, you know, imagine you um, imagine you've got a thousand pounds in your account, okay, and you could you could try and triple it through a drug deal, or you could spend it on um, you know, uh, or you could spend it on a better education. Right? What's going to make you better off? How bad is it really if you're going to have a drug deal? How many people are really going to get hurt from your drug dealing? These things are very difficult to know, and different people will decide differently. You know, and you know, there'll be also their social, you know, their, their, their social upbringing and so on that's going to shape that. Thanks very much, Jan. Hopefully, the answers weren't too uh, predictable. Uh, so there's a question down here, and then we'll move somewhere over here. Thank you. You've both tackled the sentence, my brain made me do it, with brain and maid, but I suspect the real culprit is in me. Who is the me who is made to do it? So in a lot of the examples both of you gave, you were talking about me as the whole person, the person who rescues the child, the person who makes the cup of tea. But I think the problem with the illusion of free will is that we imagine something it's my brain, you know, there's the brain and there's me who owns the brain. It's my hand, I, I am the one who controls the hand. So there's this kind of, I think, mythical inner self. And it seems to me that in view of the kind of evidence you're presenting here, and with the great value of reductionism, etc., we need to give up these illusions of a self who is conscious and has free will. And paradoxically, possibly, I would turn to the gentleman back here and say, this is why I delight in the way spirituality and science are coming together, because they're coming together with an understanding that what we think of as me, who has free will, cannot be. 
And so you get in many religions the idea of surrender, you get it in Islam and Christianity, and in Buddhism the idea of anatta, giving up the self who has free will, and the, the ultimate of non-action. And this seems to be the way forward. You don't need all those paranormal, I've, I've worked with um, Rupert Sheldrake and Dean Ray Dillon, we don't need that stuff, we, here. we need this very difficult task of letting go of free will and self. And then what? of moral responsibility, I think, you don't ask the question, is that a bad person who needs punishing, and therefore retribution, and you know, but would it do any good? So if by locking the line up or whatever, you stop them, you know, locking people up to stop them doing harm, deterring people, because they can be deterred, and if they're mentally unstable or too young or whatever, it's not going to do any good. So I think our legal systems and our, our idea of moral responsibility will be fine if we would give up these delusions. Uh, and I'll make a comment to put the me back in. Yeah, sure. Um, no, that was, a, um, that was a really nice um, question and... Um, was the question? No, well, okay. I'm, I'm going to take it as a question. Um, or something that demands a response anyway. Um, and I agree with, with, with a lot of what you say, so I'm just trying to work out whether I can answer this in a sensible way. I think there are, there are two really competing viewpoints that people come at this with, I think, both people who sort of aren't philosophers, are, and, and this is just their kind of intuitive, immediate take on it, and also philosophers as well. On the one hand, you have the kind of view that you just described as the kind of mythical view, right? There's this sort of mythical me, um, and, um, well, obviously you wouldn't think that it was mythical, but there's this extra, there's this self, there's this extra thing that's over and above the brain, and so on, and so on, and so on. And um, when we hold people morally responsible, moral responsibility is this incredibly sort of deep, um, this incredibly deep thing that uh, means that you're deserving of kind of, um, you know, eternal damna damnation or at least, you know, really very severe punishment and so on. Um, and on the, other on the other side, you kind of have people like me who sort of never, never really believed in the mythical self um, or the idea of kind of eternal damnation or, or sort of really retributive punishment anyway. Um, and I think that a lot of the problem when people talk about free will is they kind of mean different things by free will and more responsibility, right? So I'm in, in the camp that had, had quite a sort of, you might think of a, a, as a sort of fairly thin notion of these things to start with. So I don't feel like I'm giving anything up when I say, um, you know, you're praiseworthy for saving the child, but not in, in, in some incredibly deep sense, right? Just in the sense that, look, there's a difference between someone who is just, uh, you know, someone, someone just tweaks some things in their brain and they're acting merely as a result of that versus someone who kind of deliberates about what to do and then behaves um, accordingly. Um, there's going to be a difference in moral response. I think there's a difference between those, a moral difference between those two cases, right? Um, and if you have the kind of, the, the, the sort of the, the self um, and this very robust notion of moral responsibility and free will, um, and you've agreed, once you've agreed that that's a myth, you now can't see any moral difference between those two cases. And I, so, did that make any sense? Yes. yes. So, I think so. I sort of think I agree with you. It's just that I didn't. I, I don't feel like anything really substantial is being given up. I just think we should just set that view aside. I and think most people don't find it as easy as you do. Yeah. No. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Jan, do you want to make a quick comment on that? Sure. Um, and I think we, we kind of come to an important point here, which is really you know, also the, the, this point of moral responsibility and where are we left with this. And I think that there is, I mean, my view of this is, I mean, certainly as a, sort of as a neuroscientist, I, I do know that under certain circumstances, reward and punishment can work wonders. Right? They can really shape a person's or an animal's brain profoundly. Right? But... Um, the, and I think that, you know, intuitively we understand that and intuitively we use that. It's, it's very natural for us to get angry at somebody and snap at somebody who's wronged us, all right? And it's, it's natural also for us not to want other people to have snap at us. These sort of things are, I think, are important for small children to learn, you know, just basic politeness. Um, and I think that ultimately also the idea of, you know, punishing people in court kind of stems from that, but then it loses its utility. Because of course, if you if you, if the idea is that the brain learns from experience, then the you know the consequences have to follow on the actions pretty swiftly. Otherwise, you cannot form an association in your brain. All right, the action still has to be ringing in your brain when the consequence is felt. All right, and then it becomes positively or negatively reinforced. If you you know so justice delayed is justice denied. You know our courts don't really do a very good job there. Um, the um, you know and. Um, 
Yeah, you know, maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, we've got time for two very, very quick questions. Uh, yeah, one right at the back again. <laughs> This sort of follows on from my first question, I guess. So sorry to everyone else for continuing to hold this microphone. Um, it struck me first when, Dan, you were talking about the Lion Keeper and um, how that was almost like a uh, mechanism for dealing with neural disorders. And, and I reflected again during the conversations that's been going on about um, the nature, almost like a, a dharma, where people submit to some sort of default setting of morality. And if they diverge from that, due to some, some problem with what their main brain made them do, then, then they need to be managed. And this leads to a very interesting, somewhat totalitarian uh, sort of politi political state, where you effectively, you've got a sort of a neurology of crime and punishment, haven't you? And a very much a sort of a society of management. Very, very quickly. I think that is an excellent point. And of course, you know, when I said earlier, you know, sort of that crime, you know, sort of reward and punishment can really work wonders, that does come across as terribly controlling, right? and it, and I think that this sort of and we we rightly are suspicious of too much control because you, we also need to have room for creativity. You know, and room, room for creativity only arises when they, when we are free to make mistakes, right? And when we are prepared to when we try out stuff, and if it doesn't work, people are going aren't going to come down on us like a ton of bricks. So it's important to to let people make mistakes because otherwise they're never going to create, which is also why I think you know, it's much better to work with, you know, with, with praise and reward than it is to work with punishment. For example, if you want to raise your children, if you just keep punishing them uh, and never praise them and never reward them, don't be surprised if um, you knock all the creativity out of them. Thanks, Jan. And a quick comment, Helen? <laughs> um, uh, again, I agree with everything that Jan just said. Um, uh, but I guess the, fun my, the fundamental point I'd want to make is that uh, while uh, praise and reward and punishment are incredibly social, socially useful things, we all know they are, um, I still want to say there's a, there's, a, there's a distinctively moral issue at stake here, right? So the, the, you do want to lock up the lion that just, the hungry lion that killed the child. Uh, you also want to lock up the person who just committed premeditated murder. Um, I think the difference between them isn't merely, it doesn't merely amount to things like, well, um, you can make an example of the person who committed murder, but you can't make an example of the lion, because the other lions just don't understand. <laughs> this is what will happen to you if you eat the child. Um, so I think there's more than just practical utility to praise and, and blame and punishment. So when we think about what the right kind of society is, or ought to look like, we're not just thinking about the practicalities of... Um, you know what will uh, uh, what will allow people to lead certain kinds of lives. We're dealing with sort of fundamental moral questions as well. Thanks very much, Helen. One more question, a very very short question, very small one. Go on. Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh. I'm use, use this one. Oh, Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering when you're talking about prediction and prediction of people in on mass, if someone that's in a meeting where obviously the, the flow of the meeting is going one way, uh, what makes the person stand up and say, I disagree with this? Uh, however well they do it, however emotively they do it, or uh, calmly and, and uh, logically they do it, what tips that balance to get them to stand up against, well not against, but, but in that, that, con that, that context, what makes them do that? Thanks very much, Ali well, I think that, you know, people, you know, there, there's always a conflict, right, of, of, of what it is you might want, you know, of, of different desires that you have. I mean, one might be to stand up for what you believe in, and the other is, you know, to conform. And, you know, I think different people will simply resolve that differently. And, and this is partly, you know, how they were, it's partly how they were brought up. You know, partly how they are, uh, I think, to a large extent, how they're brought up. Hello? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's psychological question. Um, people are different and thank heavens otherwise life would be very boring. I was slightly worried when I made I did the 50p thing because there was some activity going on over here and I thought and I didn't have a plan B. I was going to say please, please don't come up to the front and tell a group joke. I don't know where to go from there. But luckily in this particular case everybody did what I thought they were going to do. Phew. I was trying to think of one I can tell you. I can assure you. Uh, 
let's thank our speakers this, uh, for this month, uh, Jan and Helen, for a very stimulating talk and discussion. And also thanks to all of you for coming along. I'd like to make just two short announcements before we finish. The first is uh, to remind you all not to forget next uh, month's Cog Talk, uh, which will take place on the 3rd of April, again uh, at 6.30. This time it's going to be on euthanasia, to so see if you can fight your way out of the room. <laughs> and dementia. Yeah. Uh, euthanasia and dementia. And also tomorrow there is going to be a side scene uh, film event taking place uh, in, this, in this room, in the cinema, uh, with Martin Coe speaking, and there'll be a screening of Pi. Uh, what time is that on, Lucy? That's at 7. At it's 7 o'clock. Aronofsky, who made Black Swan, it's his first film, and so it should be quite good. And thank you all very much for coming along.